bit warm. <laughs> Morning. So, Pastor Ron last week declared that this is a month of unity. And not just unity, but intentional unity. They drew from, from the letter to the Ephesian church. And so I want to go back to that today. So if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at it's just a few of the verses that he was looking at. But he talked about, in Ephesians chapter 4 verses, he used all of 1 through 7. And it says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father over all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Thank you, Father, for your word, your word that guides us, your word that gives us wisdom, Lord, your word that gives us peace if we will take it, but Lord, most of all, it leads us to you. This morning, I just ask that you bless this message. Let it be your words, not mine. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, I know I'm a math teacher, but even to me, that was a lot of ones. I don't know, like 20 of them or something. I can't count. But that is what unity is. It's standing as one together, saved by one Savior, led by one Spirit, bringing glory to the one Father of all. The problem with unity is we are human. And we have, as my wife likes to say, stinking free will. That means no matter how much we want unity, the storm will come. The winds of division will blow and we will be tested. We have a choice though. We can let the storm destroy us or we can reject the world and cling to God and with love we can weather the storm and come out stronger than we were before. And this morning, that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the storms that are coming and how God can get us through it. But first, take a moment and greet a few people. Let them know you are glad they are here, because we are. We are so happy everybody is here. And that we're going to learn about weathering the storm, holding on to God and his word. Take a few minutes and, and greet.
As you start to make your way back to your seats, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance. Thank you for this chance for us to, to gather in fellowship and, and worship you, Lord. It is always touching to my heart to see, see and hear the laughter because we have great fellowship here, Lord. And so, Lord, I just ask now that as we move forward, that we have calmness and that we take in what you have to tell us because these storms that I'm about to talk about have devastated churches. They have broken churches. They have closed churches. But Lord, you have given us a way to not let that happen. And Lord, as long as we follow you, that won't be a problem. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Ron told us last week that the way to unity is following Ephesians chapter 4, just verse 2. He says, having humility and gentleness with patience and bearing with one another in love. You do that, and we will have unity. He also said he could preach for an hour just on that verse. I promise you the Lord did not give me an hour-long sermon on that verse. <laughs> but I do want you to see how those four things help us weather the storm that will and have come our way to break our unity. This morning I want to talk about three storms. And they are the major ones. I mean, there's always little minor storms, but those are, those are hiccups. We can get through those. But these are the biggies, the hurricanes, the class five tornadoes. The most destructive, the most destructive of these will grind a church down and split it apart. It is a storm of conflict between individual members. So we might as well tackle this big storm first. What happens when one member has a problem with another member or, or a group? And I've seen it. And on many occasions I've seen it. And it seems like we have a tendency when that happens to take the worldly path. But we should be taking God's. See, it goes something like this. Penny has a problem with Sam. The problem can take many forms. Oh, maybe uh, he insulted her or the way, you know, she's upset with the way he does ministry or they said something to each other or, you know, one of them wants carpet and one of them wants wood floors or yeah, you get the idea. Usually, the arguments over, aren't over anything big. Penny gets upset. Penny complains to other people. Penny and others start grumbling about Sam. Sam might hear about this, and he starts grumbling to other people about Penny, and now we don't have unity. We have God's house divided. There's a lot of talking going on. The problem is not new in the church, unfortunately. It goes back to the beginning. James tells us in, in chapter 4, verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? He's asking. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? He's saying you want it your way, and that is why you fight. Paul tells us in Romans 14, 1, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Come on, guys. Who cares if it's carpet or if it's wood? Is that really worth fighting over? Who cares whether the carpet is blue or red or green? 1 Corinthians 3, 3, Paul tells us, For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only in a human way? When we do things our way, when we do them our way, when we argue our way, when we do them the worldly way, it causes strife and division. Galatians 5, 7 through 9 says this, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He's saying it takes one person. It takes one 
person to start the division and then it spreads through the whole church and unfortunately it spreads like poison and I've seen it happen and it's ugly and it hurts everyone not just one or two people it hurts everyone when the church is divided everybody is hurt God most of all so what are we supposed to do what is there to do Ephesians 4 2 says we deal with it with all humility and gentleness we deal with it with patience and we bear with one another in love not by grumbling and spreading it through the church so here's like six points for this first storm God tells us how to get through this God tells us how we get through this with unity so if you have a problem with another member of the family the first thing you need to do is go in prayer to God asking him to shed light on the conflict what's this problem well you may think you know doesn't mean you do go to God ask him Proverbs 3 5 says trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding it's that other person's fault I know it it's all him I realize I am not ancient but I am quite old and I have never ever seen a problem between two or more people where anyone was 100% in the right and the other person was 100% in the wrong it has never happened so we go to God in prayer and we ask him Lord what 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 what's up and then we listen to him and point two the second step is to with humility because that's what it's going to be with humility consider where you are wrong in that conflict you're asking God God point out to me where where, where is it my fault Lord, what am I doing wrong? Even if it was just my response to somebody else, if my response was wrong, then I'm continuing that conflict. Lord, tell me. Tell me where I'm at fault. In Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5, Jesus makes this quite clear. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the log that is in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When we have conflict with another Christian, we often fail to recognize the contributions we've made to that conflict we are blind to it so let's get that log out of our eye you're going in prayer to God you're considering your part in the conflict and now you remind yourself this thing there's a conflict there's an issue I've got a problem if we're doing it the worldly way we're doing it wrong because at this stage, we should be reminding ourselves that conflict is not about winning. Not in the family. It is about reconciliation and restoration. We should be trying to reconcile ourselves with our brother or sister. And we should be trying for restoration of that unity. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. See, there's that gentleness. I'm not coming at you yelling and screaming. Brother, we got a problem. Let's work it out. Luke 17, 3 through 4 says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins again against you seven times, look at this next part, in a day. This isn't over a lifetime. This person is annoying you constantly. 
If this person sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. You see, when we have a problem with somebody, it's not about winning. It's about restoration, bringing them back, bringing you back, bringing everybody together. Jesus is writing us that we are called to forgive over and over and over again. But I don't want to. Come on, pastor, he just irritates me. I've forgiven him five times. I'm not doing it again, really? How many times has the Lord forgiven you? How much has the Lord forgiven you? I can't count how much he's forgiven me just today. All right, so here's where the rubber meets the road. You're in prayer. You're asking God to guide you. Now, stop talking about them and go talk to them. Oh, it's easy to talk about somebody. Oh, man, did you see what he did? That was just horrible. I can't imagine how much he's making me mad. You know you agree with me. Right? If you have a problem with someone, God tells us clearly. I mean, these are Jesus' words. In Matthew 18, 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go tell everybody possible and take out a newspaper ad. Oh, no, that's not what 15 says. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, not how much can I spread this on Facebook and how many likes can I get and how many shares can I get. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. There's that restoration again. There's that reconciliation. This is where you talk about the problem with the person. Remember, the object is not winning, but reconciliation, unity. It is about coming in love and humility. This means you are discussing the issue, not name-calling and yelling and screaming. Oh, we have had such a hard time with this. It is easy for me to blame a person instead of working on an issue. It is easy for me to say, oh, he's mean, instead of saying, you know what? There's an issue here. If he's mean, why is he mean? For example, I might take Chad off to one of the rooms and say, hey, brother, the other day we were struggling with communication. Notice the issue. I was hurt when you cut me off. See, specific issue. When I was trying to, to have this deep theological discussion with the three-year-olds running around here. Can we talk about this? Because you know the three-year-olds are the only ones that can really have those type of conversations. It's about the issue. I'm going to go and talk to that person, not at that person. I don't, it's not about them and me. It's about the issue that's separating us. So let's look at where we are. At this point, you have an issue with someone else. You've gone continually, not once, not twice, continually to the Lord in prayer, helping to find a solution to the problem, not the person. You've humbly asked him to point out to you to you, where is your involvement in this conflict? You have a heart of rec reconciliation, not I'm a right and they're a wrong, and I'm going to win. You have gone and with gentleness, not yelling and screaming, with gentleness, and talked to them about the issue in conflict. And if for some reason that is not enough to res get restoration at that point, if you cannot resolve the conflict or issue between the two of you, and since unity and reconciliation and restoration are the goal, God tells us it's not over yet. There's another step. If you go to them individually and you cannot solve this problem, now, now you may involve other people. Now you can get a trusted person 
who can mediate for the both of you, not your best friend, not the 10 people that are already on your side because, well, we slipped up. We, we didn't go first to them. We went to 10 people first. Matthew 18, 16 says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Let's talk about mediation here. Grab a pastor, grab a leader, grab a pastor's wife. Grab somebody that's trustworthy. That's not in it to find a winner and a loser. But the thing is, is you, you have to be willing to listen. The goal is still a restoration between the two of you and the unity of the church. And despite what you might think after stage one, these leaders, these mediators, these people that are trying to restore the church, this unity, may decide fairly that you are both wrong. And forgiveness is necessary on both parts. Because again, it's not about winning or losing. It is about glorifying God and restoration of the two of you with him. Acts 15, 1 and 2. Look at this. Look at this. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. See, there's a problem and they're talking to each other about this. Paul and, and, they're, Paul and Barnabas are leaders to begin with. But instead of going, hey, I'm right, you pay attention to me. These two groups of leaders can't figure it out. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and other elders about this question. You see, it's not just us that sometimes have these problems. Sometimes leadership has the problems with each other. If the issue is so bad and the conflict such that it cannot be settled and the unity of the church is threatened, Jesus tells us there's a third step. You're in prayer. You're asking God to point out to you where you've gone wrong. You've talked to the person one-on-one. -on -one. You've gone to some leaders, some elders. You've asked some pastors to come in and try to resolve this conflict between the two of you. And the sides aren't budging. Really what that means is some of you ain't listening. Jesus tells us there's a final step. The church is a body. Needing unity must decide what is to come of the issue and the conflict. Notice how Jesus finishes in 1817. If he refuses to listen to them, now you tell it to the church. You see, first it was one-on-one. -on -one, then it was a small group. And now you've involved the whole church because the unity of the whole church is involved. And Jesus says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile, a tax collector. Because at that point he was talking straightly to Jews. What Jesus is saying is instead of letting the body, instead of letting the body, the church, be divided by conflict, it would be better to put a person or persons out of the church and out of the fellowship until they have repented. That's not where we should be. My question is, is if you get that far, how far is that person away from God? How far has that person fallen away? But the nice thing is, is, wow, we have a lot of steps to get to and to go through and a lot of chances for reconciliation before we get there to restore the unity of this body just because two members couldn't get along. 
If necessary, one of you sit over here for a while and one of you sit over here for a while until we can figure it out. And then once you're restored, maybe you'll sit here in the neutral zone. See, these are all the neutral people. We sit here in the middle. I don't know, I was just making it up. So storm one is the conflict between members. And that happens. <laughs> You've been going to church for more than maybe a couple of weeks. You've seen it. The second storm of conflict is the conflict with leadership. If the first storm doesn't destroy us, whoo, hold on. Because now you guys got a problem with everybody else that's in leadership. Which just means half of you to begin with. About half of us are leaders of some sort of ministry here. That's the beauty of this church. God has given us a lot of ministries. But here's the thing. There are two ways this comes about, and the first way this comes about is when you have a problem with a person in leadership. Maybe I told you that you need to work harder at your marriage and to apologize to your husband, and now you're mad at me. Maybe Ron hurt your feelings, or you feel you know how to do something in ministry better than the leader of that team, and they're not listening to you. That's really not this storm. You see, this storm is the same as the first storm. Because you don't have a problem with leadership, you have a problem with a member of the church. They just happen to be in a leadership position. Like every other member of the church, it will happen and there is now a storm of hurt or conflict. So let me point you back to the last six points in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Because if you've got a problem with a leader in the church, just because they've been called to a position of leadership does not mean they are not a member of the body. That means you don't have a problem with leadership, you have a problem with that person. And go back to the last six steps. Prayer, humility, and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Personal leadership is still part of this. And you should still go to them individually first. And if you feel it is necessary for others to go with you, let me give you word of caution here. This is the one time I will tell you, you probably should take a pastor with you. It's just going to make things easier. Remember, we are still looking to restore the relationship and unity in the church by following God and glorifying Him. Your problem with a leader in the church is still not about winning or getting your way or them getting their way. You must be willing to forgive and find a path of unity. Really, the storm of leadership, the second storm, I'll call it, of leadership, is this. It's not an issue with a person, but with a direction the ministry is going or not going, or possibly what you might see as a doctrine problem. And let me give you an example of this from the early church. In Acts 6, 1, it says, but with the believers multiplying rapidly, see, the church is just starting and, the, and it's growing and growing and growing. It says, but with the believers multiplying rapidly, there were rumblings of discontent. Those who spoke only Greek complained that their widows were not being taken care of properly, discriminated against, and that they were not being given as much food in the daily distribution as the widows who spoke Hebrew. Notice the problem is not with an individual. It's not like, hey, I don't like Peter because he's, no. They're just saying, hey, our guys aren't being taken care of. Actually, our ladies. Notice that the problem is not with the individuals. It is with their widows being taken care of. And I have to point out that the first thing I saw when I read this was a mistake on the part of the people. Before I even get to the argument, right, about the problem with leadership, I want to point out the mistake that the people were doing. In verse 1 it says, there was rumbling of discontent. What that means is they were talking amongst themselves instead of approaching leadership. Murmuring is no small matter. It involves a direct violation of Jesus' teaching that complaints, that the complaints be taken directly to those involved. Instead of murmuring, Murmuring is the gathering or the simmering of discontent that spreads by word of mouth from one person to another. 
Rather than seeking a solution, murmuring stirs up sedition. Just like with individuals, they needed to take it to the ones in leadership first. Despite their errors, take notice of what the, how the apostles handled this. In Acts 6, 2, it says, so that 12 called a meeting of all the believers. Hey, there's a problem. Let's, let's talk about this. They gathered the church body, and they did not hide the issue. Yes, there is an issue. Peter could have corrected them for not following Jesus' instruction. He, he could have played the pity card. Oh, we're working so hard in preaching and teaching all of this. Why do you complain? Instead, they listened to the issue and met it head on. Then they offered a solution. In 6.3, it says, Now look around among yourselves, dear brothers, and the select seven men, wise and full of the Holy Spirit, who are well thought of by everyone, and we will put them in charge of this business. Then we can spend our time in prayer, preaching and teaching. You see, when there is this type of problem with leadership, leadership should be willing to talk about it, just like Jesus tells us to, and then find a solution. If you remember back... In Acts 15, when people came and questioned Paul and Barnabas' teaching of not needing circumcision, they did not waste time arguing with them. There was a problem when they went to Jerusalem to get the leaders together and to discuss this issue. Paul and Barnabas are just talking to the Gentiles, getting the Gentiles saved, teaching the Gentiles and saying, nope, you ain't got to get cut. Some come down from, from Jerusalem and say, oh, wait, wait, if you want to convert, you got it. Paul and Barnabas is like, look, we're not going to have this. Let's go talk to the leaders. Acts 15, 4 through 12, they arrive in Jerusalem, and they met with the church leaders. All the apostles and elders were present, and Paul and Barnabas reported on what God had been doing through their ministry. But then some of the men who had been Pharisees before their conversion stood to their feet and declared that all Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow all the Jewish customs and ceremonies. And so the apostles and church elders set a further meeting to decide this question. This is a doctrine issue. Hey, is this important? You can only use a KJV Bible. No, you can use an NIV if you want. It's that type of an issue. And this issue was bad and tough enough that they thought they needed to understand it better. So they set a meeting to discuss it. Notice in verse 7 that there is a long discussion. People's voices were heard before Peter, Barnabas, and Paul start saying anything. Starting in 7, it says, At the meeting after a long discussion, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you long ago to preach the good news to the Gentiles so that they also could believe. God who knows men's hearts confirmed the fact that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he gave him to us. He made no distinction between them and us, for he cleansed their lives through faith, just as he did ours. And now, are you going to correct God by burdening the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Don't you believe that all are saved the same way by the free gift of the Lord Jesus? There was no further discussion. And everyone now listened as Barnabas and Paul told about the miracles God had done through them among the Gentiles. Once the discussion was done, and the leadership listened to both sides of the argument for and against this issue, they made a decision based on the Bible and the Holy Spirit leading them. And Acts 15 continues with this. When they had finished, James took the floor. See, it's not one leader, it's all of the leaders. James took the floor and says, Brothers, he said, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people to bring honor to his name. And this fact of the Gentile conversion agrees with what the prophets predicted. For, listen, for instance, listen to this passage from the prophet Amos. Afterwards, said the Lord, I will return and renew the broken contract with David so that Gentiles too will find the Lord. All those marked with my name, that is what the Lord says. Who reveals his plan made from the beginning? And so my judgment is that we should not insist that the Gentiles who turn to God must obey our Jewish laws. This did not go the way the people thought it would go who had issues with Paul's doctrines for the Gentiles. Know that just because you have an issue with something does not mean that you are right. 
And if the leadership in prayer decides that you're on the wrong side of the issue, you can decide that you will follow God and accept their leadership and their decision, or you can decide to break unity. I ask that you prayerfully consider your choice. The followers of, in Acts decided on unity. In 1522, it says the, the apostles and elders and the whole congregation voted to send delegates to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. It is important that we are careful when there is this type of issue with where or how the leadership of the church is taking us. It's not wrong to bring questions. Sometimes leaders miss things. Sometimes leaders, leadership misses issues as they did in, in, in Acts in the early church with the widows. Sometimes, as in Acts 15, the other person or persons with the issue are, are wrong. They just have it wrong. And they have to be willing to listen and follow the leadership. Reconcile with the decision and restore unity. Communication and following close to God is so very important to fend off this type of storm. So far we have seen the storm of conflict between members and the storm of conflict with leadership. We've also seen that if you are in prayer and following Jesus' teaching in Matthew 18, that there is a solution and a way of working through these conflicts and to survive these storms. Ron said last week, and I want to stress it again today, God wants unity in his body, the church. He wants it so much that he tells us that even coming to the altar to offer him worship should be held off until you have unity. In Matthew 5, 23 through 24, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. He does not tell you to stew and be mad. He says, leave your gift and be reconciled with your brother or sister who you have a problem with. God wants us to offer him our gift of love, and we show him that love by loving our brothers and sisters. That's why he commands us in John 13, 34, to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. His love is one of sacrifice. Can you not sacrifice some of your pride? Can you not sacrifice some of your pride, your stiff-neckedness? For the sake of your brother or sister. We're told in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Is it so important that you are right that you hold on to your anger or hurt that you can't honor your brother or sister above yourself and bring unity to the body? The first two storms try to tear us apart from within. The third storm is from outside of the church. It too is dangerous. This storm is led by Satan doing all that he can to divide us. I've gone on long enough. And I said I would not preach for an hour. That's because God gave me a sermon that is longer than an hour. Relax, I'm going to finish it next week. <laughs> next week I want to talk about that third storm, the storm from outside of the building. The storm from outside of our body. And as appropriate since next Sunday is also Father's Day, I also want to talk about how the men of the church should be standing in defense of the body and how they are standing in defense of the body. So let us pray that the first two storms don't destroy us, that we follow God instead. Next week, we'll look at storm three. Dear Heavenly Father, you are... You are wonderful. You know before we do that there were going to be problems. And before we could even begin to worry about how we should deal with it. Father, you were prepping the disciples and the apostles. You were prepping them ahead of time. You were telling them, look, I'm going to tell you how to solve these issues. Because I want my body whole. And so that was passed down to us. Lord, we now know that there is a way for unity 
it starts with loving you and it ends with loving you by loving each other father you gave us your son out of love and we are called Christians followers of Christ Lord the only way we can be followers of Christ is if we love one another so father thank you for that it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.